uh, Dr. Douglas is the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at the workshop, so welcome. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. And then Jay. Yeah, I'll do it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I submitted this talk about a month, month and a half ago. Vape additives were a simmering issue. At this point, it has boiled over. Vape illness is national news, and there's people in rooms, regulatory lawmakers that are scratching their heads trying to figure out what's going on. So, I updated my talk. The subtitle now includes all additives, not just terpenes and flavor additives, but we will focus on terpenes and flavor additives. So, articles like this started appearing last year, beginning of the last year. They started appearing on the heels of some good academic research. Some labs, some academic labs, some here in the state of Oregon, found additives, particularly flavor additives, in nicotine e-cigarettes were causing problems. There was some understanding now of uh, toxicology that was a problem, and you started seeing this in the news. But not everybody was paying attention. Some people that were paying attention are some of the regulators that are here at this conference and they started asking questions. A lot of those questions led them to answers that they didn't necessarily have the technical expertise to deal with this very complex and technical problem. A couple months ago, vape illness was coined, the phrase was coined, and this became national news. As it became understood that there were patients presenting around the U.S., multiple states, different clusters, that are having this issue with vape illness. Uh, at the time, and even still, it's not completely understood what is going on. It seems to be a acute condition, somewhat related to inflammatory conditions. In most cases, infection has been ruled out, and you're starting to narrow down what some of the causes might be. Um, there has been recently some identification of possible smoking guns, but it still is not clear what is going on. Two, three weeks ago, the CDC stepped in. The CDC is now working hand in hand with the FDA to try and organize this issue, trying to get a handle on what's going on here. Two weeks ago, the first reported vape sickness fatality was reported. Um, this happened back in July, and, and subsequently there's been a recent case, uh, a recently reported case of another death back in July. A week ago, David Downs from Leafly published this article. I share it here because he asks an important question. He asks, why now? What has changed? And before I get into this, I'd also like to use the sandwich approach like the previous speaker. I wanted to share something that happened yesterday. FDA had a call, a meeting with state health officials where they actually called out a specific substance they then share that it's still a little too early to understand what's going on, and they can't find a smoking gun at this point, but they did specify that a compound called tocopherol acetate is present in a lot of samples that they have analyzed. So that as background, I'd like to now go into what we can do about it. What we, from an analytical standpoint, a regulatory standpoint, and a cannabis community standpoint can do now to address this issue, even after we understand what's causing vape illness. So here's the three points that I'll use the rest of my time to address. We need to look at flavor additive and additives in general, safety for inhalation. We need to draw a distinction between cannabis vape and nicotine vape. And we need to start somewhere. We need to come up with some prohibited ingredient list and some uh, permitted ingredient lists. So the first question that's raised when we talk about starting somewhere is, can't we use existing flavor regulations for inhaled ingredients? The answer is that there are some pieces that can be used, but there is no wholesale list of ingredients that are safe for inhalation use. There is often talk about generally recognized as safe lists. These, are, these depend on intended use, and your grass lists depend on ingestion use. So this is a very different thing from a toxicological standpoint when you ingest something versus when you inhale it, especially when you inhale it after heating it to perhaps 500 degrees. But there's some pieces that we can use. 
So what is often a big surprise to most is that there's no safety data on additives used in tobacco products. Uh, this comes as a surprise because there's been, for decades now, a, a list of additives that have been used in cigarettes, but there really is no safety data or very limited safety data on inhaling these, particularly after they've been heated or combusted. In the nicotine vape world, there's a little bit more. FDA really hasn't listed or released any sort of public list when it comes to anything that's prohibited or permitted. They're busy trying to introduce their pre-market approval approach to nicotine e-vapor products. And for now, even though we know that they're looking at this issue, they haven't released any particular data on saying these ingredients are prohibited. Some of these other characteristics that uh, we can be looking at, things like inhaled drug products, people think, okay, well, this is an area that FDA has looked at. What sort of flavor and ingredient safety is there? Well, there's no flavor additives allowed for some of these, these types of inhaled products. There's other realms that we can use to inform what we do, but we are essentially starting from scratch. In Europe, we have a little bit more to go on. Um, uh, nicotine vapor products in Europe do have some regulations when you're looking at the aerosol and vapor plume. There's a couple of ingredients that are prohibited. Most of those ingredients center around things like vitamins that would mislead or potentially mislead the consumer in thinking that these products are healthy. Other ingredients that are prohibited are things like caffeine or taurine that could have combination physiological effects. And there's some compounds that are known to be carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive hazards that are definitely prohibited and some tested for. The other question that often comes up is, we're cannabis vapor products, we're new, we don't necessarily have the money to do the research or the wherewithal to figure out some of these complex toxicology issues. Why not wait for nicotine and nicotine vape products to figure it out? Well, the answer to that is tobacco and cannabis are very different. And I don't think that needs to be explained to anybody in this room, but some of the things that come to mind when we're differentiating between tobacco and cannabis are, for one, ensemble effects. Entourage effects, whatever you want to call the polypharmacy of cannabis, this is one of the things that led to the first medical initiatives for cannabis to be prescribed to patients. Things like Marinol were not necessarily effective. But looking at research or showing that whole plant cannabis or other compounds in cannabis were having effects that single compounds couldn't. An important thing that I like to point out here is that terpenes are classified in the food world as flavor additives. So this is often a surprise to people. Sometimes people think that terpenes are unique to cannabis, but the truth is a lot of the terpenes that are found in cannabis are already regulated for food as flavor additives. So we have a scenario here where if you start to have nicotine, flavored nicotine products eliminated or outlawed, like has recently done this past week in Michigan, you could have a bleed over to cannabis products. So it's a very short shift to go from outlawing all flavored nicotine vapor products to all vape products together. So and that's what I think scientists, the cannabis community wants to avoid threatening or eliminating terpenes in vapor products. So other differences here, one that I'll point out is different diluents and carriers. Uh, this is timely because it pertains to this understanding or growing understanding of what's causing vape illness. So another question that comes up, is this a unique situation? Uh, are we dealing with something that we've never done before? And the answer to this is that no. Interestingly enough, six decades ago, as food technology was on the rise, new food chemicals were being added to food, and there was a bit of a public outcry saying, well, what, what is in our food? What's being put in our food, and is it safe? So we've been here before, and being a student of history, I think there's some guideposts for us to look at and playbooks to follow and getting to, this, to an answer to this problem. So a little bit more of the history of what was done for food additives in the United States. In 1958, the Food Additive Amendment was passed. When this happened, this established a pathway to assess the safety of food additives. At that time, the Food and Extract Flavor Association, called FEMA, established an expert panel to look at the toxicology, the science of some of these additives. 
This was originally self-regulation for the food industry, but then morphed into a very successful government industry partnership. So there's stuff we can build off of as we're trying to solve this problem in the cannabis industry. So where else do we start? For cannabis, like FDA did when they first tried to solve this problem for food additives, they created a list. They had no idea what was in our food six decades ago, which probably comes as a surprise now because we expect that to be generally understood knowledge. But at the time, they had no idea what was in food. So they started creating an inventory of what was in food at the time. I suggest we do the same thing with cannabis. We have a lot of scientific literature now that has declared what cannabinoids, terpenoids, other chemical compounds are found in cannabis, and we can use that as an initial inventory of what may be or may not be safe to use in manufactured cannabis products. Cannabis labs have a role to play here. They look at cannabis, different types of cannabis every day. They have vaults of data that they can contribute to this effort to either corroborate what's been published in the literature or to add new items. Uh, from that inventory, we can then start creating an initial permitted list. Uh, my thinking is that if we start, since we need to start soon, since vape illness is a critical issue currently, we can start with a permitted additives list based on what's naturally found in cannabis. So the relative risk thinking there is that if it's safe to consume in inhaled cannabis and combusted cannabis, then it should be safe with certain requirements in manufactured or vapor cannabis products. In addition, we can also create a draft or initial prohibited list. There's some disparate data around that describes some of the toxicology in different situations of flavor ingredients or different additives. We can use that and compile that into a starting point. And these lists don't need to be perfect. We can add to them, we can edit them as time moves on, but we need a starting point now. This is a list of some of the terpenes found in cannabis. Every terpene or compound on this list has been described by at least five authors in the published literature. There are many more. Uh, one of the speakers this morning showed upwards of 400 compounds or terpenes found in cannabis, but this can be your starting list. This is a list of potentially concerning inhaled flavor additives. And for the chemist in the audience, you can see some chemical motifs that although we might not have specific and perfect toxicology data on individual compounds, we may be able to draw some conclusions based on what particular chemical motifs cause a problem when inhaled or when heated at high temperatures. These three that I highlight here are three that are tested for in European nicotine vape products. This is a list that was recently released in the Federal Register by FDA uh, about a month ago. It is a proposed harmful and potentially harmful constituents in tobacco products and tobacco smoke. Incidentally, this is causing some confusion in the nicotine vape world currently because this is, list is substantially different than a list that was uh, put out about uh, months before that. So I highlight a few different compounds here. Diacetyl, 2,3-pentanedienone, that was on the previous list. These are flavor compounds that often come up as causing potential hazard or causing some serious hazard. Those highlighted pink here are common nicotine diluents, carriers, cutting agents, the common PG or VG. So where do we be begin to assess safety? If our data is limited and sparse, what do we do from here, from this point forward? Here, I think we take a page out of FEMA's book, the Flavor and Extract Manufacturers Association. We need a targeted industry association that focuses on this complex issue. It has to be cannabis specific. It has to be focused on inhaled at the very least or vapor products and, uh, specifically. From there, again, following FEMA's lead, we can establish an independent expert panel. So there's a panel of scientists that are non-conflicted, that can assess what data we have now and where data needs to be created to fill in the gaps. So the important role that cannabis labs have to play or cannabis researchers have to play here, cannabis labs and researchers can help corroborate this cannabis compound inventory to give at least those state regulators and legislators that are being pushed to create uh, regulations and laws to protect the public, give them a framework to base some of their 
actions upon. So cannabis labs can corroborate this or can add to these, this compound list. Cannabis labs can begin to offer vapor product testing, and here I mean vapor plume testing, aerosol testing. Now, most cannabis labs currently do not offer vapor plume testing or aerosol testing. Mostly you're testing what's in that vapor cartridge. So by offering these tools, labs can help further the community's effort towards safety. And labs can also begin to use and develop standardized methods for comparison. So if labs are using similar methods, the data can be ported and aggregated, and it can be easier to draw conclusions about what's going on. So why does the cannabis community need to act now, in particular? Well, one is we'd probably like to preserve standardized ensemble effect formulations, and we'd probably like to avoid terpenes from being outlawed in manufactured cannabis products, for one. But more importantly, nobody else is minding the store. FEMA has disclaimed this issue. They understand that their toxicology data is based on ingestion, and they know there's a lot of holes when it comes to inhalation data. And leadership is required at this point in time. There's people that have started to, to die from vape illness, and this presents a potential crisis point, a watershed moment in vapor product regulation and our industry in general. So to come back to the sandwich, call to action, Evaluate flavor additives for inhalation safety. It doesn't really exist now, but it needs to. Draw a distinction between cannabis vape, nicotine vape, and even types of cannabis vape. Draw a distinction between vape that was purchased in regulated stores versus black market vape, or things like vitamin vape products that are out there. And that's to just the community. That also goes for the media. It is easy to use a single syllable term to refer to many different things like vape, but it's also a bit lazy. You can very easily then describe it in more specific terms with an additional qualifier. Call it a cannabis vape, call it a nicotine vape, call it something else. And we need to start with a prohibited and permitted list of ingredients. So if what I said resonates with you and you'd like to step up with this issue, whether you're a lab that wants to be involved in the technical part of creating new methods, developing new methods, or you're just a firm or other community member that wants to help build this industry association address these very timely issues, come see me after my talk or after the conference. The time is now. Thank you. I think we have time for some questions. Hello. Oh, there you go. Hi, Brad. Okay. Very, very, very nice talk. Thank you so much. I could not think of a more timely and important issue to be discussing in front of all these white folks. Um, I totally resonate with the idea of creating these permitted and prohibited lists. And one additional component or layer to that is concentration. So, you know, if we hyper concentrate something that is an approved and it looks, you know, grass as an inhalable substance, what is the concentration at which it is still safe? We know that there are U-shaped dose response curves with a lot of these molecules. Um, we know that, you know, some of them are not U-shaped, um, that they're totally fine and anti-inflammatory at low doses and totally toxic at high doses. So I just wanted to make sure that, you know, just because we have now created this idea of a permitted substance, that that has, you know, additional qualifiers to it. Well, that's an excellent point. And there's a, a famous adage in real estate that says, location, location, location. The same is true in chemistry or medicine. No. Concentration, concentration, concentration. And just creating these lists is just a start. We then need to establish those concentrations that might be permitted or what the safe range of use is. So it's an excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, let's uh, give uh, Dr. Douglas a round of applause. So we have about a 10 or 15 minute break, but um, well, I imagine a lot of people will be coming in at 2.45. We have the plenary address, so um, please come back and join us for that. Thank you.